Hey, I'm Warren Sprouse. I'm your host and your guide every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. right here on thebibleforum.net. This is the Bible Forum. We're talking tonight about the five biblical tests for a prophet. A fellow by the name of Chris Valatin, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, has put together a basic training for the prophetic ministry. Now, if that sounds strange to you, it's because you have a Bible and you understand what prophecy is and what the prophetic ministry is. Chris doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have a clue largely because he's wrapped up in uh, Bethel Church in Redding, California. This is where all the resident crazies are uh, with all the nutsy stuff. I mean, it's just amazing what comes out of this little church. But I reminisced, or not reminisced, <laughs> I was ruminating on his article, uh, and you can find it at a Charisma uh, magazine uh, and spiritoferor.org if you want to go online. But I was thinking through somebody who's put together five biblical tests grown, growing out of a training program for prophets. And it just caused me to remember Balaam's ass. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, here was this guy, Balaam, who had a, had a ministry. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't anybody godly. But he was a prophet. He'd go around, he would do that. And he was called upon to come and curse the children of Israel. And his donkey was able to tell him what was going on. He didn't have any training. And there is no training in the Bible for prophets. God gives utterance to the prophet. On God's terms, in God's time, God's way, God's words. But Chris has five tests. Does the prophet believe in the redemptive work of the Son of God? If he does, you can rest assured that so far, so good. False prophets do not like to listen to anyone. They believe that God tells them everything. If you find somebody like that, it's probably not a prophet. False prophets are not motivated by love but are motivated by a need to be noticed. Well, I can think of a lot of Old Testament prophets that didn't come across as loving. John comes to mind. In the New Testament, remember John the prophet? They'd cut his head off. He wasn't nice. False prophets commonly use fear to motivate people. If somebody's coming at you with doom and gloom, if that's the central feature of his prophecy, he's probably not a prophet of God. And lastly, he says, false prophets are not in a covenant relationship with the body of Christ. They're standing off there by themselves, apparently. They're not members of a church. They just arrive on the scene and they just begin to talk to people and they start telling you what God has to say. And everybody gets excited, but it's not real. Can you say Benny Hinn? Can you name one of these charismatic lunatics who stands up there and tells everybody they're going to be well if they can get touched by the master, by by the preacher. Come up here, let me lay hands on you. The Spirit of God is... Or Robert said the healing was in his right hand. He died of a heart attack. He was in the hospital. I think he was in intensive care for five days. I don't know why somebody just didn't grab his right hand and put it on him. And I want to know where his buddies were that are in this ministry. Why didn't they come and heal him? These are false prophets. Christopher Valaton 
has offered five non-biblical tests to determine whether somebody's a prophet. And the tests are bogus. But they reflect the charismatic flavor and philosophy. That if you just feel like God is on me and I have to say this stuff, then you're a prophet. You have a gift of prophecy. Where do you exercise this gift of prophecy? In the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a whole list of things that God gives to his people, and this is all for the body. Okay. That's what we're talking about? No. You do know the word prophecy has two meanings. It, it can mean God-given illumination on a subject you didn't know anything about. But it can also mean existing prophecies, things God has already said that you get to bring out at the right time in the right circumstance. It can mean that. It doesn't always have to. But 1 Corinthians 12 is not talking about spiritual gifts. I don't want to upset you, but check it out. It's talking about things the Spirit of God is capable of willing to do in believers according to God's will in God's time for God's purpose or not. Read it. It talks about the gifts that God has given. It talks then about the way these gifts work or are structured. Then it talks about the way these gifts are manifested. Then it talks about all these things that everybody thinks are spiritual gifts that, well, I have the gift of prophecy. I, have the gift. I met a guy who had the gift of casting out demons. I said, oh, where do you do that? He said, in my church. Never met a demon in my church. I don't know. This is kind of crazy. Can God motivate his children and can God still work in people to give them these supernatural abilities? Amen. The Spirit working severally as he will. Not as Chris Valaton wills, not as Warren Sprouse wills, but as the Spirit of God wills. Has God ever given you information have you ever known something? You don't know why you know it or how you know it? Have you ever said just the right thing at the right time? Have you ever thought to go in a direction you never thought before only to realize that that was the very best thing you could have done? Do you not give God credit for any of that? Do you have to speak in tongues, which is nothing but gibberish? When God wants to speak to his children, when God wants to speak to the world, he does it through the word of God. The existing word of God is sufficient. There's nothing else that need to be said. And the last book of the Bible says it clearly. If you add to what God has already said, Look out.